Welcome to White Collar Briefly, a Perkins Coie mini pod. Delivered in short doses, this mini podcast features informal, on topic discussions with in house experts, outside counsel, and other thought leaders on a wide array of cutting edge and practical white collar and compliance topics. Visit PerkinsCooey.com for more information on our nationally ranked white collar and investigations practice. On this episode of White Collar Briefly, partner Kevin Feldes speaks with Tony Davis, CEO and CIO of Inherent Group, a value-based investment company that uses environmental, social, and governance, or ESG, factors to make investment decisions. Kevin and Tony discuss key ESG factors, describe how focusing on these factors can create value for companies, and also discuss the risks involved with failing to focus on ESG. Kevin and Tony also offer some insights into how the SEC's creation of a new climate and ESG task force within the Division of Enforcement may impact how companies evaluate and disclose ESG compliance. The views expressed on this podcast do not necessarily reflect the views of Perkins Coie LLP and should not be considered legal advice. Hello, everybody. I'm Kevin Feldes, a partner at Perkins Coie in our White Collar and Government Investigations Group, and welcome to another episode of White Collar Briefly. Today, I'm very pleased to have Tony Davis, the CEO and CIO of Inherent Group. Inherent Group is a value-based investment company that uses ESG factors to source and underwrite investments. In addition to spending a lot of time understanding ESG issues, Tony and Inherent Group apply ESG analysis as a fundamental part of their investment process. And in doing that, they believe that they improve their assessments of corporate values and improve how they evaluate investment risks and rewards. So welcome to White Collar Briefly, Tony. Thanks for being here. Thank you. It's great to be here with you. Well, over the last few months, we've been hearing a lot more about environmental, social, and government considerations for companies. In fact, last week, the SEC announced uh, their creation of a climate and ESG task force within the Division of Enforcement. But you and Inherent Group have been focused on ESG for a long time. Can you tell us about Inherent Group and your focus? Yeah, I'm happy to. Well, we're, we're a sustainability investment firm at our core. I started my professional career at Goldman Sachs and then ran a large investment manager called Anchorage Capital, but left in 2015 really to focus on sustainability issues that were important to me. And that, that evolved over time, really started more of what I'll call impact investing, with the, which is SDG-aligned investing. And we have a particular focus on SDGs 3, 4, 7, and 9, so health and wellness, education, environment, and infrastructure, especially digital infrastructure in developing economies. But it, but, but it evolved also to think about sustainability issues in ESG across any sector of the economy and how we could use ESG as both a sourcing tool, an underwriting tool, you know, as you said in your introductory comments, how to better assess both risks and rewards of companies. And then, and then ultimately as an engagement vector, how we could work with companies to try to improve their ESG performance. So that's what we've been up to and busier than ever, but uh, loving it. Well, that's fantastic. And really appreciate what you said about the impact investing. It sounds like it goes way beyond that, though, for you and and frankly, for any company today. You mentioned uh, risks and rewards. So what I'd like today to do is maybe frame our discussion around how ESG factors really can provide rewards for companies, how it can lower the cost of capital and generate these revenue tailwinds that I know you've spoken about quite a bit. And then maybe we'll turn into the ESG as risk risk factors for companies, or in other words, that you maybe ignore ESG at your peril. So, you know, maybe let's start there. And then, of course, at the end, I definitely want to give our listeners some practical considerations regarding ESG, and, and we'll turn to that as we close. But let's start with rewards. So how do you view the environmental, social, and governance issue as really helping companies reward in their revenue and, and other ways? Well, at the at the highest level, there's a growing body of research and evidence that companies that lead on financially material ESG issues in their space, and we can come back to talk about what that means, but those companies outperform those that do not, both in terms of their fundamental operating performance and economic return on invested capital, as well as in their share prices. So, at the highest level, ESG pays, and there's, and as I say, there's there's growing academic evidence of that. But I think you know one 
one way we like to describe it is just sort of talk about the different areas and ways in which it can pay. And so we, we'll just walk through the, the income statement and the balance sheet and talk about revenues and how both in terms of revenue productivity, so the productivity and sort of benefit that you get from your partners and the go-to-market, but also in terms of developing new products and services that are aligned with some of these SDG societal trends can help drive top line. Clearly through employee engagement, one can improve productivity within the firm uh, and see expense reductions over time. There are very there are many projects which can be undertaken that have rapid paybacks and on the environmental side. You know, people report increased innovation um, by leading on ESG as well across their firm. So so there's a lot, a lot of things I think on the on the income statement side of the equation. Some of those can take longer to manifest themselves, and so approaching it really with a return on a sustainability investment mindset, I think it's helpful. One of our one of our partners and advisors, Tansi Whelan, runs the Center for Sustainable Business at Stern, and one of the things they've done is really they put together a ROSI return on sustainable investment framework, which really makes the case to CFOs that you know ESG pays in a financial financial manner. You know, also from a risk standpoint, we point to the avoidance of unforeseen liabilities as another way in which ESG can pay. Um, And then you mentioned cost of capital, you know, again, growing evidence that companies that lead on ESG can lower their cost of capital. And the basic intuition is quite simple. You take two companies that do the same thing. One that leads on ESG has less risky cash flows than the one that does not. And therefore, should have a higher PE multiple and lower credit spread, all else being equal. Okay, well, yeah, this, let's break some of those pieces down. It seems intuitive maybe to probably me and, and maybe some of our listeners that in certain industries, you know, environmental compliance is a fundamental part of their business, for example, and, and that's where the E in ESG comes from. But from what you're telling me, this is much broader. This isn't just something for companies who happen to you know, be in the environmental sector or have uh, environmentally risky businesses. This sounds like it's much broader. So can you give us some examples of you know, how and why it's broader? And how do you really measure the E, the S, and the G? Yeah, there's a, there's a lot in each of those. So let me get started and please kind of redirect me. But yes, so... What are the most financially material ESG issues? Well, first, I should say governance is going to matter, of course, across all industries, regardless of which industry you're in. So we can set maybe governance to the side for a moment, but we can spend, we can come back to it and talk about what we look for, because you know you can. And Tony, you're, and when you say what you look for, you're actually making investment decisions based yeah, upon yeah, these absolutely. considerations. You know, so as we think about it from investors, and so you know, governance, good governance, it leads to better risk management, it leads to better. Capital allocation leads to better incentive alignment across you know, the organization. Those, you know, those are the things that we're really focused on from a governance perspective, not not necessarily some of the more kind of check the box uh, matters. The E and the S, of course, and which of those are the most financially material will differ if you're in a consumer products business or you know a bank or industrial you know mining company. So we then are really we are asking ourselves, what do we think the most financially material ENS issues are in this space? And we'll borrow from some of the work that groups like SASB, Sustainability Accounting Standards Board, has done in mapping some of those materiality issues. But uh, that's generally how it will start. And then as an investor, we'll, you know, we'll just ask ourselves, ask the company, and, and we'll, we'll, we'll look to, We'll look for publicly available information that can help inform, you know, our opinion of how they're doing on those most material issues. So you must have a framework that you use, or do you also rely on these uh, outside sources that are that have different frameworks? So we we have developed our own framework. You know, we're getting into another area, which is part of the challenging around sort of just getting access to ESG data can be very challenging. It's part of why we're excited about some of the disclosure mandates that are evolving globally. And then once you have access to that ESG data, what you do with it and kind of what algorithm you put it through to make it meaningful to you and your kind of investment process can differ. And we see it differ among the, diff- the, the, the different ESG rating agencies that are out there that ultimately have a pretty low correlation in terms of how they rate companies because they value different things, right? And we, we approach it as, you know, we're, we're not going to value 
carbon mitigation over water conservation or uh, gender parity over living wage, what we're really asking ourselves is for this business, we think we understand their unit economics, we understand the, the, the industry in which they operate, the, and what are what are going to what are going to be the most meaningful for the long term sort of impacts on the business, and and then we typically will distill that into sort of not more than probably three issues that we kind of that we really focus on with management as we try to engage with them. So that's our overall approach. I think I got away from kind of the original sort of question. <laughs> so. Well, no, no, this is useful because you know the very fundamental part of what we're you know talking about today is that. By looking at how well a company does on ESG factors, and I like that you really clarified relevant to that business because ESG might mean might mean something different for different companies, or at least in the in the specific. But looking at those things really help you evaluate how successful that company is going to be down the line, and maybe maybe in a material sense whether their value is going to go up or down. Yeah. Yeah, and so just to maybe just put some specifics around it, I mean, we're working with a CPG company right now, and so, yes, we're looking at supply chain resiliency, and we're talking about some healthy, um, you know, new product development and reformulation of existing products, but we're focused on diversity and inclusion, and spe specifically uh, female representation on the board and in kind of the senior leadership ranks, again, not just because it's the right thing to do, it's the right business thing to do, and particularly in this space where 80% of the purchase purchasing purchasing decisions are made by women you know they just are you know in our in our assessment woefully underrepresented on the board and in their um, senior leadership ranks so that's kind of how we will decide you know which issues we're going to focus on you know, I can give many more examples in different sectors but sometimes it tends to be more environmental and safety related particularly in the industrial space I mean, some of the financial space will spend a lot of time on regulatory and on um, cybersecurity right now. So it, it, it tends to be that some of the most kind of um, key issues that we dig in on are, are, are sector specific. Right. And, and of course, it does sound like for very good reasons, there is going to be some universal components of ESG that are applicable anywhere. For example, as you said, diversity on a board, I think would apply anywhere, but perhaps, you know, cybersecurity again, anywhere, but might have more relevance in particular industries. Or if you're in the mining sector, you'd certainly be much more focused on some of the environmental compliance issues. So that, that does make sense. And you mentioned you have developed your own ESG framework or factors. I don't know if you can elaborate on that anymore, but I do want to you know, touch on that and then get into some of the risk factors. So if you, you've talked about why this is positive and you can see, you know, sort of tailwinds, this is pushing companies in a positive direction, but it sounds like not focusing on ESG is, cre is also seen as creating risks. Yeah, that. Yes, that's right. So, you know, there, there are kind of broadly speaking, probably two camps out there that, of folks that look at ESG both as a revenue kind of tailwind. And we think of that more as are you SDG aligned? Like there's some of these great mega trends of decarbonization, of value-based reimbursements or just, you know, affordable health care with good outcomes, of healthy foods, of water scarcity, of sort of digital infrastructure globally, financial inclusion. You know, we just think these are multi-year investment trends that we should be investing behind but you know there are there are, are, are other you know critical sort of uh, of course sectors of the economy that don't maybe directly map to one of the SDGs and in that instance we're using ESG more as a risk framework um, and asking ourselves you know are these businesses leading in their respective sectors and so I mean, just to quickly tick through it, you know, governance, I'd say the big things that we're focused on are diversity inclusion, again, leads to better risk decisioning, better capital allocation, better innovation. We spend a lot of time on, on executive compensation. And really, you know, if you really want to know what, you know, we feel the company believes, look at, you know, how executives and then senior and middle management are, are, are compensated and make sure that that's aligned. But all, you know, We'll, of course, look at the other you know, things that you would expect on governance, but those are a couple of the things that we tend to tend to really focus on. On on on, on environmental, you know, we ask one, we, we look at physical risks of carbon uh, and climate change, but we think about transition risk probably even more. And there, we ask ourselves one simple question. I mean, we will look at the scope one and two data and try to assess scope three, but we ask ourselves really how would this business perform in a hundred dollar per ton carbon price environment? And what would it mean for the unit economics of the business? And sometimes it 
you, you get to unexpected conclusions on that. You can be in a highly emittive industry, right? But if you're leading the decarbonization move or on the, you know, the front end of that innovation curve in cement or steel or heavy transport, you actually might be a winner in that environment because cost curves are going to adjust dramatically, right? So that's, that's how we approach really thinking about um, carbon. Then we'll look at other environmental risks that may be specific to that, to that space. And then on social, our focus, again, will run towards, I mean, really what we're trying to get at on social is what, what is the DNA of the company and how do they, how do they think about their, their workforce and their people as an asset and how do they invest in their people? I mean, that's, that's really what we're trying to get at. So sometimes if you're like in an industrial space, you can pull lots of safety data and get some like hard data on it, or you can see, you know, how they compensate their people relative to others in their sector. Does that tie into sort of this concept, Tony, of, uh, of corporate culture? Uh, as, as you know, I was a, a federal prosecutor for a lot of years before working here at Perkins Coie. And, you know, often there was talk of what's the corporate culture. So something goes wrong in a company, it turns out it's a violation of, of the law. And, and people want to figure out, well, how did this happen? And, and there was definitely discussion of what was the corporate culture leading up to this incident? We look at their so we, what we'll do is we'll look at any data that's available to us, and we'd like to see more companies, incidentally, and publish their EEO ones. That's be really helpful in terms of getting a sense for, particularly on the diversity side. But we'll interview existing and former employees. We'll talk to others uh, in the industry that are competitors. We'll talk to industry experts through our networks and ask them about. There's we have actually a list of culture questions that we'll ask. But, you know, some of them will be things like, tell us about a time where you had to forego short-term profits to achieve kind of a long-term goal. Tell us about something you're least proud of in your company or in your industry. You know, tell us how decision-making occurs. And is there, you know, do you encourage dissent, right? Certainly, you know, we get a lot into compensation. Is there, you know, we try to assess what the, the, the culture of risk-taking is in the firm and do they manage risk? But anyway, there's a whole series of questions that we'll ask. And, you know, we, we can't ask them generally in one setting, but every time we're on with the company, we'll ask a couple more of those questions and we'll ask it of different people and try to see how they respond. Again, trying to get at this question, which is very difficult from the outside of what's, of what's the culture. Like, how do, you, how, do you, how do you see, you know, Dieselgate before it happens, right? How do you catch kind of a, a you know, a selling scandal at Wells Fargo before it happens, right? Um, you know, how do you... How do you sort of get ahead of the environmental catastrophe at Vale or at BP before they happen? And you can't always, is I think the, the, the truthful answer, but you can get a sense for, is there, a, is there a culture of compliance? Is there a cult, you know, do they, again, do they invest in their people? Do they think about, you know, risk management throughout the organization? Um, yeah, those are incredibly great questions. And I think you're going to get, you know, and obviously you do get pretty revealing and important information in response. And that makes me think of two things. One is that over the last number of years, the Department of Justice is really focused on corporate compliance plans and asking companies that do find themselves under investigation to demonstrate what have they done to invest in corporate compliance beforehand. And, you know, they'll analyze that, you know, what kind of plan do you have? Is your plan working? What do you do to evaluate your plan? Does it match? Is, you know, is it is it off the shelf or is it custom? Is it tailored to you? So the kind of questions you're asking seem to be very dovetailed with that. You know, what what is uh, what is the process within the company for for taking risks, evaluating risks and minimizing risks, for example? But the second one, and, and I want to, you know, put this out there and then turn to you because it's very timely is the SEC's recent uh, focus on ESG factors and, in fact, their press statement the other day that they're creating a new climate and ESG task force that will evaluate and pursue tips, referrals, and whistleblower complaints on ESG-related issues. So you mentioned, you know, sometimes it's a challenge to get information, but it sounds like now that the SEC is increasingly going to be looking at that. Are companies being forthcoming regarding these things? Is that going to make your job easier or harder? You know, how, how do you see that matching up with, with your investment decisions? I think it'll. I, I I think it will make our job easier. You know, as you as you know, sort of the you know the kind of trend toward disclosure has has been less is more. I think often driven by legal departments, 
and yet we want decision useful ESG information. And so, there, you know, the, and in fact, the SEC, uh, I, I, I believe it's since 2010, has, a, has had a mandate to pursue climate related disclosures and yet just really haven't enforced it. So we're really hoping to see much more enforcement out of the SEC on climate and, and ESG disclosures. But I, I think overall the trend is towards more disclosure. I think what we hear from corporates is, like, can we can we get some clarity on what it is you people want? Because we get, you know, it's the death by survey. And so and I think almost in a way, if we could agree, again, using something like SASB as a framework, but we could just agree on what we want to see be disclosed. I think it might make life easier for, for, for many companies. And we generally in, encourage our companies to, to say, look, it, no one's asking for perfection. What we want to see is just that you've, you've done the materiality mapping. You've got buy-in from your stakeholders as to what are the most material issues that you need to be tracking. And so let's make sure we're measuring those issues and we're tracking them. And and please make those available to your investors just so we can see kind of how you're performing over time. And again, you know, much less interested in the glossy sustainability report and much more interested in sort of hard KPIs and seeing how the company's managing those. So I hope we will get more and better disclosure. And, I, and I'm, I'm hopeful that the SEC is going to be, be part of that. Well, it sure sounds like it, you know, just from the fact that they're creating the task force and, and uh, where it's placed in the division of enforcement. And again, emphasis being put uh, in this press statement on a focus on evaluating tips, referrals and, and whistleblower complaints, which certainly seems to signal that there's going to be a, a whole lot closer look for companies. And, and you're right, though, it's been it's been relevant for years. And, and the SEC has made, you know, has indicated the relevance, certainly, of focus on climate change and other things as having potentially material impact on companies. And if it does have a material impact, are you disclosing that? You know, is are you letting folks know that that inc- could impact the future of your business? Right? Yeah. So so I see I do see the trend uh, clearly, very clearly. And in fact, I think Gary Gensler, the uh, President Biden, um, and Vice President Harris's nominee to be the next uh, SEC chair has indicated that he would likely pursue rulemaking around climate risk disclosures. So it sounds like there's there could be more on the horizon. Yeah, I think I, I think if companies are not already, you know, they should be preparing themselves for quickly being required to disclose at least scope one and two, and hopefully we'll get scope three emissions shortly thereafter. And what I'd like to see on top of that is what is, you know, what's your plan for complying with the Paris agreements and how are you going to get there and, 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 and give us some milestones. We don't want to see a 20, you know, 2050 goal without what's got, what should I expect to see in 2025 and 2030, right? So that's kind of, I think, the minimum ask right now of companies. I suspect that's going to ratchet up over time, but I think if you want to at least comply with the minimum, start disclosing scope one and two and come up with a plan to, to comply with the Paris agreements. Have you been seeing this around the world? Uh, I know you know we're hearing this now and, and we see that the SEC is, uh, you know, there's going to be some, some changes, but you, you are investing worldwide and considering, you know, worldwide markets. Have you seen this focus on ESG factors uh, elsewhere. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, Europe, Europe, you know, is, is, has been leading in, in this regard from a policy standpoint and from a disclosure push. And I and I think they'll continue to push forward. We've seen certain stock exchanges around the world ask for more kind of ESG disclosures. So we we do see like the overall trend towards more disclosure, more compliance. So we've talked about the the reward basis, how how uh, focus on the environmental, social and governance can really help add value to a company. And in fact, you're recognizing that value and in making in investment decisions. And uh, and then we've been talking about the risks, in, in, which now include the fact that the SEC is is going to be increasingly focused on compliance and disclosure of how these factors impact your company. Looking ahead, can you give some, you know, let's talk about some practical tips. Let's spend a few minutes on trying to help companies, uh, no matter where they are on the spectrum of ESG, meaning are they just starting to think about it? Have they been working on this on years? Or no matter what industry that they're in, how can they, how do you recommend they think about ESG? Yeah, I appreciate that question. And, and we've talked a little bit about it today. You know what we find is that you know larger corporates usually often have 
sustainability department or the budget to really get organized around some of these issues. Uh, for some of the small and medium sized companies, it can it can sometimes be you know more challenging. It falls to other groups. But we always start, as, as I mentioned, with the materiality kind of get buy-in from your stakeholders. So from your certainly from your investors, but really from your employees, customers, regulatory bodies. Of kind of what are the you know let, let's let's just agree on what the most material issues are. And for that, for your specific company, what does it mean for you? Yeah, what does it mean? What does it mean for you? Yeah, and your company, and so. And, and, and get buy-in. And, and we would love to see a board group designated uh, to oversee sustainability, but you know, it'll often find its way into risk. And, 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 and then what we really want is, is, is more disclosure. You know, the old adage, you can't manage what is it measured. But we, want to, we want to see it measured. We want to see it managed. And then, and then as outsiders, we just want to see progress. I mean, that's the most important thing. Just get started and, and demonstrate progress. And I think it's, uh, you know, back to the culture sort of point, it's, it's hard to sometimes really put your finger on this, but we've just heard it from so many companies and we've observed it ourselves as a sustainability investment firm that, you know, as you create buy-in around these issues and you articulate your vision of leading on them and as your organization being a mission-led organization. And again, it's not always going to be that your product solves world hunger, right? But, but, every, but every company in every sector, I think, can have a mission orientation if it's only just to sort of, you know, lead on operational excellence and or promoting diversity and inclusion or like we're going to be the least carbon emitted steel player in the world, you know, but getting buy-in I think can create a real, a real sense of attachment to the company and mission alignment, and you'll see less turnover. You'll see more productivity out of your employees. And I would say, you know, every every CEO I talk to, at least in the top three of issues that keeps them up at night, is talent, attracting and retaining talent, right? And this is a great way to do it. So just selfishly, I think um, I, I I think it can really you know pay for the company. But that's we typically say get started with your materiality map and get buy-in from your key constituencies, and then. Uh, measure and manage those key KPIs, and and disclose. So let people know what you're focused on, and let them know you're serious about uh, you're serious about it because you're measuring it, and you're going to let people know your progress. Well, how do you know? How, how do companies know when they've when they've done enough? And and maybe the answer is it's never enough. But I, I think it's a practical question. You know, I get asked on all kinds of compliance issues. For, for good companies who want to do the right thing, but they're just living in a reality of, um, you know, that maybe they can't do it all or we all have budgets or competing priorities. So how does, how does a company know when they've sort of done enough? Gosh, that's, a, that's an excellent question. I think that I, I'm just going to use it for us because how, how do we know if we've done it? How do we think about it in our own business? And you know, I think there's there's both a relative and absolute measurement stick that we use. So we think about how do we you know stack up next to our peers uh, in the investment management industry, and what are we doing in our own business? You know, to 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 lead on avoiding our carbon emissions, to lead on promoting uh, diversity and inclusion, to really lead on serving our clients. And then, but then there's an absolute you know there's an absolute sort of question of can we can we do more. As an organization, and you know, we're 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 not a huge firm, and so we struggle with what, how much can we take on? And you know, I'll give you one specific example. Last year, you know, as we were going through Black Lives Matter, and we were really reflecting, you know, what can we do as a firm rather than putting out another statement? And so we 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 made a uh, adjustment to our internship program to really um, make it more evergreen in nature, so we have more people come through, and to really focus the top of the funnel on. Um, candidates of color and particularly those from underrepresented colleges and low income backgrounds. And, you know, it just, we, we, we felt like that created additional sort of maybe a buy-in and bond from, from our employees at the firm. But so we're continually looking for things to do. So I know I'm not answering your question because I don't, I don't, I don't, I don't actually have a good answer to it. I mean, I think Every CEO will say we comply with the law, but that's clearly not enough. I and mean, we're talking about like going beyond that and creating a culture of kind of around sustainability. Um, uh, absolutely. Well, I, I mean, I like I actually like your answer. I think you have answered it. And my, my question 
really did doesn't have a good answer other than to say there is no uh, stopping point. It, this is this is a process, and we probably shouldn't ever be looking at it as if well we you know we've done enough. Th- there isn't doing enough. It's something that we're you know we would recommend companies continually focus on the way you've described and and always evaluate and there's always something more to be done. So I like the way you've answered it because also because as you just suggested if you're running the company just just so you can comply sort of barely comply with the law you're you're you've kind of missed the conversation I think we've been having today and and really you're you're going to you're going to miss both the tailwinds we've been talking about and you're and you're really going to continue to have those kinds of risks that that uh, we certainly would be recommending people avoid well, this has been a great conversation. Um, I really uh, appreciate everything that you're doing at Inherent Group to focus on these issues. You know, I'll just close with ask you to close with any parting thoughts about the work you're doing or and the trends that you're seeing uh, in the future. Well, first, let me say I've really enjoyed the conversation as well, um, Kevin. It's been great to chat with you and. Um I think it's an exciting moment in time. I mean, it's it's just, you talked about the SEC, but we're really seeing so much movement across industry and business to, to, to lead now on these issues and to help us really address these great challenges that we face, inequality and climate change, among among others. So I'm, I'm, I'm very optimistic at this moment in time. And um, I think that we desperately need corporate Corporates to, to lead the voice. Their voice is really important. It also it also informs what policy ultimately we see out of Washington. So really great, gl- glad to be on today with your clients and applaud them for their efforts. Encourage them to continue to continue pushing forward. Well, that's great. Me too. Uh, and and I, I appreciate the optimism. I share it. I think we're talking about these issues is is inspiring. And, and companies need to lead, and they will. So thanks for being here, Tony. Best of success. Uh, look forward to chatting with you again soon. Cheers. This concludes this episode of White Collar Briefly. Please visit whitecollarbriefly.com, where you can subscribe to our blog and find additional updates on current white collar and compliance topics. White Collar Briefly, a Perkins Coie mini pod, copyright 2020 by Perkins Coie LLP. Thank you for listening.